the difference between being a barber yeah. and being an owner 100%. physically looks the same to the punters. You know, you're standing behind the chair cutting their yeah, hair. Most barbers. Yeah. Um, whereas inside your head, there's kind of squirrels juggling chainsaws. I mean, you used to have this old boy come in who was a barber himself, retired, tried walking in. I was like, hello, mate. I was like, you're not going to like me. We're, um, we're actually appointments now. So I'm booked up today, but I'm going to have to book you an appointment for tomorrow or whenever you're free. And he was like, you're not busy enough for appointments. I was like, what do you mean? He went, how many haircuts do you do an hour? I was like, at that point, it was 30 minute services. I went two and he went, you should be doing at least five. He went, you're not busy enough for old appointments. School. And walked out, never see him again. And I was like, okay. And I was like, and but I completely got what you're yeah, saying. Yeah. That's that's my background. When I opened up my first one, yeah, we outpriced everyone enormously mm. with that sole intention of, you know, we're just offering something different. You're not buying here what you can buy there. Oh man, for like the first month, I think we had more people storming out, shouting how much. <laughs> but it does it does wear. And I was like, I'm not kind of, I'm not, I'm not doing it. That's the price we cut. Yeah. That's what it's costing me to have this shop. And, but it's hard to stick to your guns. Hi, welcome to the Noble Barber podcast. I'm Anthony LeBand, and we'll be talking to various people in the industry who've made it and their journey and how they got here. Talking honest, cutting through the crap, and making sure your story and their story is heard to help your business and hopefully mine. If you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button and I hope you enjoy this, this episode. Welcome to another episode of the Noble Barber podcast. Um, I'm Anthony LeBan, and I'm here today with Wes Jones. Wes, thank you, mate. Great to see you. You too. Um, and we're talking, I guess the thing to talk about really with you is, is, is about owning a shop. Yeah. And being, being, the, being the boss, I think, is the thing. I mean, yeah. you know, I think <laughs> you know, there's been lots of other bits that we can talk about. And obviously, I came across you and we met at Barber Connect when we did mm -hmm. our podcast there. Yep. And... Um, but I think the interesting thing for me is your store and what you've been doing with the Heartbreak Club um, and how you came to it. So rather than going through your whole CV, sure. maybe we could just talk about the – you could give us a bit of an idea of your lead up to you becoming the owner of the Heartbreak Club. Yeah, absolutely. Um, wasn't intentional. Wasn't even in the pipeline. I fantasised about the idea of having a place. Um, was busy working in shops, trying to make ends meet, and – I used to do a thing. I used to travel from different shops every two years. Just for some reason, two years come around and I was like, I need to get out of the shop. Wherever I was working, I, I, I'd, I've always thrown myself a lot or a lot of myself into where I've worked. Mm. And it doesn't necessarily mean I've been the best employee or best person to work. It just means I get fascinated. And I, there's probably something else going on with that. Yeah. But I used to get two years done and my battery would go, Bloop. I've got nothing else to give. And there's no... There's no ladder to climb. No. With the self-employment barber thing, especially in the barber shops I was working in, there wasn't really managers. You might no, have no. had a manager, like it was more salons that had managers. So there weren't really anywhere to aim for. So I thought, right, new place, new location. I'm going to get out of where I was, which was Canby Island, go to Leon C. It's a cool place. Something might happen. Went to work in a uh, tattoo studio with a little chair in the side. Oh, okay. Had no clientele. Pretty much, other than my mates and a little bit of clientele because I went 30 minutes down the road. And this was kind of a time before, or well, about when Instagram was sort of just starting. It's very hard to retain clients right. without a number. Yeah, so if you yeah. leave a shop, I ain't got all their credentials. We didn't have a online system. Online bookings and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah um, so went to Lee, started cutting air, weren't making any money. I was renting a room at the time, which I couldn't afford to rent. And I was being like, shit, this ain't going well, what am I going to do? And at this point, one of my best mates who was very successful at the time, a, young, a lot younger than me as well, he just is one of them. Like right. for the future, he's Bill Gates, them kind of guys. Oh, okay. um, he's a CAD designer, but a very clever one. And I always cut his hair, we'd always be mates, we always go out for, both had bikes, motorbikes, always used to go out for a beer. And he was like, oh man, if I ever had the money, I'd invest in a shop with you. And I'm like, good luck, it's not going to happen. Because I wouldn't have anything to match. Um, right. other than my skill set which you get into a position where you think I'm good at what I do but how much is that worth to someone else you get taken for granted a little bit um, you know, especially in the barber shops of old when you're doing four haircuts an hour yep. I yeah. think your clientele can take it for granted a little bit and mm. forget that you do have a skill set to them in that environment you are just a guy to go and see yep. once a week once every two weeks give 15 quid or whatever the rate was at the time so 
he valued my skill set. And I was like, I'd love to, but it's never going to happen. Um, and then one day he was like, let's just meet up. Let's go for a beer. Went for a beer. We got A4 bit of paper. He's like, let's just write the ideas down. Let's just pretend we could do this. I'm like, okay, cool. And actually, it was a laugh. Like, it was really mm. nice because there was a lot of stuff that I didn't realise I'd developed in my own brain over the years, which when you put it on paper, you're like, that actually be a really that cool idea. Like I, did, I didn't know yeah. I had that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was kind of thing. I was like, well, that was fun. Anyway, I like, the, the, I like the one pa- piece of paper rule, one piece mate. Paper. I think if I can't make a thing work on a one bit of paper, yeah. it's not going to work. Messiest spider diagram yeah, you've ever fantastic. seen in your life. Literally fantastic. looked like someone has sneezed ink all over it. It was <laughs> dreadful. Um, but that gave you some sort of yeah, it gave confidence in what you what you did have in your head. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I remember the next day going to work and I was like, would have been nice, wouldn't it? With that, I got a text message from a guy I knew who had a barbershop down the road. And he was like, mate, do you know anyone who wants to buy my shop? I'm, no, I'm getting mate. out. And I was like, I can't. I ain't got no money. My business partner, we've talked about it, but you know, I was 23. He was 21, I believe, at oh. the time. Um, you know, that pipeline dream was more than a pipeline dream. I was like, nah, but I'm going to give him a message. So I text him, I go, Chaz, all right? had a message, guy I know down the road, he's selling his shop. You fancy having a chat? And he's like, let's meet him tonight. Oh, and I'm like, oh God, where's this going to go? I thought, you know, just be nosy. By the end of that night, we shook hands. We had an agreement of a partnership. We sat down and literally, it. when I think business deals, when you have no experience of them, they go one or two ways. They're either overwhelming and terrifying and you kind of just sit in the corner going blah, 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 like vibrating. Yeah. Or you have a good laugh and you don't actually talk about business and then you shake hands and before you know it, you're like, shit, what have we done? Yeah. And that's exactly how that went. Excellent. We sat in the pub down the road. I was like... I think lots of us have done shit, what have I done? Many, yeah. many, many times. No, <laughs> this this was a, a the worst time I possibly could have ever agreed to have a barbershop. I didn't have house. I was, I was renting rooms. I had no financial backing myself. I had nothing to come in with other than my skill set. And we made this deal. I was like, okay, right. So what we're we going to do? We had 10 days until we was taking over it. So the financial side of it. It was like, right, we need a name. I was like, fuck, like, let's go back to the A4 bit of paper. <laughs> going back to the A4 bit of paper. And all I had like in massive underlying thing was just heartbreak. And I was like, I can't even remember how we got to that. And I looked back and it was like Elvis. Heartbreak Hotel. Yeah. And then at one point it was like, I was looking down that route thinking, oh, what about like Sinatra's or something like that? I wanted something along them sort of lines. Massive Elvis fan, obviously. Um, and uh, it was like, right, what about Heartbreak Club? Business partner was like, that's the worst idea ever. Like, we can't call it that. Fast forward a couple of days, like, let's call it Heartbreak Club. That's sweet, cool. But uh, yeah, that's when what the real What was it called work. previously? What was its so first The life? original shop was called Fleet Street. Oh, okay. and it was cool it was a cool little thing and it was a definitely community based barbershop mm. and it served a purpose yeah cheap haircuts no bookings the guy worked on his own um, and I'd actually done a guest spot in there about four years before because he needed someone on a Wednesday so right. I was like I'll come give you a hand just to see what the place was like and it was manic talking like 30 haircuts a day it was that kind of gaff um, which was really cool That's that was my DNA mm. that's what I've come from but I, at this point, I'd started meeting people in London. Frank Reimer, um started talking to a few people. Did, again, I weren't in the industry. I was cutting hair. I weren't yeah. in the industry of hair. I didn't know people from further no. afield. I just knew what was in front of me and the pictures I took. I, I weren't looking on Instagram for other barbers. I weren't reading magazines. Mm. I, was, I was looking at GQ magazines, looking at newspapers for haircuts. Yeah. So at this point, I started meeting a few new barbers and they're like, oh, you know, do appointments. And that, the minute I knew we had a shop, I was like, right, we need to go in. We need to change this from being a quick quid barbershop to really focusing on what we're doing, earning money, but then the ultimately presenting people with a timed service where they're getting a, an amount back, not yeah. just a quick haircut. And it went into meltdown because we took the owner's shop. We didn't have no money to do anything. So we still had the sign saying uh, Fleet Street Barbershop. I'd printed out an A4 bit of paper with just a Google image of a guy with a beard, a Rick Heartbreak Club on it, stuck it on the window, 
And then my business partner, where he was working in, in London, he used one of the big industrial printers and wrote new governors, which we, we knew that meant new owners of the yeah. shop. So we put that at the top of the window. So people come and going, have you changed the shop to be called new governors? And we're like, no, no, we're the heartbreak club. And they're like, why have you put that up? I was like, oh, because we're the new owners. And it got mad confusion. And we took one week out from literally every day being walk-ins to then starting to be appointments on like a Monday. From that Monday, it was chaos because we had so many people trying to come in and we were like, we're actually appointments now. Um, I'm the new owner, my name's Wes. This is what we're going to be doing. And I'd say 70% of people were like, well, fuck that, I ain't booking an appointment. Mm. And, I'm, and I'm thinking, I've, and I've gone in and the haircut prices were around eight, 10 pound. I'd gone in at that point, so this is... So nearly 10 years ago, I've gone at that point and gone, right, we're 18 pound a haircut. Yep. So more than, you know, it's more than 100% more. Um, so people were having a bit of a frenzy. That first week, I'm like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. Mm. And the end of that first week, this just adds to the chaos, found out I was going to be a dad. So I was like, <laughs> okay, right, this is, uh, this is a lot. This is a wow. lot going on. What do I do? So I spoke to a few friends and I like, just got to stick at it. Trust me, trust the process. Mm. You know, you're good at what you do. Just commit to it and then yeah week to week so every week we got busy we bought something new and it slowly done it up we built a sign we built things it was like built not bought yeah, which yeah. was you know I absolutely loved that um, and then yeah it just started to grow people started buying into the appointments um, and the funniest thing that happened was we used to have this old boy come in who was a barber himself retired late 70s I'd say he walked in, he, w- he was in the first week that I took home to the shop. He walked in, I cut his hair, had some stories, really nice guy, the biggest moustache I've ever seen on a bloke. And then he came in about two months later, tried walking in, I was like, hello mate, I was like, you're not going to like me, we're, uh, we're actually appointments now, so I'm booked up today, but I'm going to have to book you an appointment for tomorrow or whenever you're free. And he was like, you're not busy enough for appointments. I was like, what do you mean? He went, how many haircuts do you do an hour? I was like, at that point, it was 30-minute services. I went two, and he went, you should be doing at least five. He went, you're not busy enough for appointments. And walked out, never see him again. And I was like, okay. And I was like, and, but I completely got what you're yeah, saying. Yeah. That's, that's my background. And yeah. I was going against everything I'd ever been taught, mm. everything I'd learned, because I could see a little shiny mm. thing in the future, which was our industry changing. Mm. And it's the best thing I've ever done. Yeah. It's very difficult to do that, though, I think. I mean, I, you know, when I opened up my first one, you know, we outpriced everyone enormously mm. with that sole intention of, you know, we're just offering something different. You're not buying here what you can buy there. Yeah. And, oh, man, for like the first month, I think we had more people storming out, shouting how much. <laughs> um, yeah. But it does, it does wear. And I was like, I'm not cutting F. I'm not, I'm not doing it. That's the price we cut. Yeah. That's what it's costing me to have this shop. And, but it's hard to stick to your guns, mate, especially when, <laughs> Very. You know, when you're doing a shop with an hole in your trousers like you yeah. were with no – you didn't have a huge bank account wedging you up. There. No. So, I, you know, I essentially put myself in a form of debt by mm. saying yes to, to doing this thing. And, that, like, but – Again, I, I could have easily just gone, no, nah, going back to a quick quick trim shop, yeah, like, you know, yeah. just in and out, like walk-ins only. And I would have got my money back. Yeah. The evidence was there. Mm. The guy who I bought it from had evidence. He had these books. He showed me how he's working out. And I was like, I don't want to be a 30-day-plus 30, yeah. 30 haircut a barber mm. anymore. I want to take my time. I want to develop and, and there's definitely be a place for them they're there and Absolutely. it works and there's definitely you know there's customers for them mm. and i always say that i think we're inheriting a new bunch of customers you yeah. know and i think we you know i think we probably take more of ours from kind of tony and guys and those kind of shops yeah. than the than the clip joint i'm always quite intrigued when anyone takes one of those spaces and converts it because yeah it's got headache written all over it you know your customer yeah. you've got a full clientele telling you you're Fucking mad and walking away. Do you know, and we still have it. When I think we're nine and a bit years in, and we still get people come in <laughs> that or come in at, in the originally and say, "Are you doing walkings yet?" Mm. And so how we do it is we're like, we are an appointment based barbers, but we don't discourage walkings. If you walk in and we can fit you in at a spot, then we will. Yeah, but it's better to have an appointment. And we've, I mean, we've we've seen a lot of transition from the guys who were like, "I'm not doing it. I'm not booking an appointment. I never know where I'm going to be." To 
yeah, can I book in every Tuesday yeah. for the next like six no, months? No, I mean, we've got benches and stuff outside and with one of our shops, we've built in a yeah. big seating area with plugs for laptops and yeah, no one's ever sat in them. Oh, Everyone really? books yeah. an appointment, arrives a minute or so before yeah. their appointment, sits in Which the chair is, and... It's kind and of sad. Yeah, I mean, but... It's lost a little bit of that yeah. that that thing, but actually the kind of enjoyment it still yeah. has a buzz when I you know when I walk yeah. in there and and the chairs are full and it's happening. It's still yeah, got that absolutely. buzz. It just doesn't have a queue of people doing that. Yeah. Well, what yeah. we've done to recognise and consolidate against that is consolidate um, is we have created like community nights. So we have a community night only once a Thursday, like one one Thursday a month. We have a bike night. And it's not specifically a bike night, but if you bring your bike down, you get a discount. But from four o'clock on a Thursday, once a month, I do walk-ins. Um, okay, cool. Just to Has that worked? That Has itch. that been enjoyed? Yeah, I mean, I've done one. Right, okay. <laughs> but the feedback was incredible. Mm. And it, it's one of the things. It's a slow burner, but once you start doing it, it was what was more important for me was we put it out there. We had a few people turn up, which was cool. It was the feedback off of that after mm. the people seeing it. You get the content, you get the pictures of people mm. come down on their bikes and walking down because, you know, from what the area we live in, people love seeing bikes yeah. and just having to wander down, grabbing a beer, coffee, whatever. Um, and we've now got people messaging us going, I'm coming to the next one. I didn't know you'd done that. Yeah. That's more important. It's just creating that yeah, bit little buzz, give back to a community. Interest. But yeah, like you said, you know, even though we're appointments and we don't have many people sitting down waiting. We encourage our customers mm. to come in early. We have we're, we're very fortunate. We're linked in with Red Bull. We get Red Bull for all of our customers, even if they don't want it. We try and Love give it. them some of them. Um, and so we get them to come in early. They have a drink, and when all the chairs are full up, I still nuts. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great environment. Yeah, no, lovely. So you're you're sitting on a empty bank account, upset <laughs> customers, and a brand new shop. Yeah, and you got a baby on the way. Yeah. It was a sounds, lot. sounds stressful. It was a lot. Um, so there's a big kind of growing bit, I think, when you become at the difference. The difference between being a barber yeah. and being an owner 100%. physically looks the same to the punters. Absolutely. You know, you're standing behind the chair cutting their yeah, hair. Most barbers. Yeah. Um, whereas inside your head, there's kind of squirrels juggling chainsaws. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's, there's a lot going on. And yeah. you're, you're trying to be kind of happy to your clients and happy to all your staff and, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. How did you find that, that transition from, you know, I've just got to cut hair and I'm going home, son, to, oh, my God, I've got to do this, I've got to do this, I've got to do that? Initially, it was easy. Right. Um, because I was lucky. Well, I say lucky. We delegated well my business partner wasn't a barber that helped massively oh cool um yeah, he took all the financial burden off me and done all of the logistical side of things it was my idea it was my position to be the creative mm. he, he was like i'm looking after this he was like i'm not investing in a shop i'm investing in you he went i know the ideas you have and i know where so he was the there to help those ideas it. still keep coming out yeah and he was like I'm just going to keep fueling you. Mate, do what you got to do. And to be fair, we we had a great time because mm. it went from us literally within about a month of having the shop, we got asked to go and do, uh, I think it was a, another British tattoo convention. We went and done that. And then this whole pop-up thing started coming. Yeah. And we were like, oh, this is quite cool. I saw and you did a bit of F1 stuff, didn't you? Was that yeah, like? a couple of weeks back, cut yeah. air for Red Bull at Formula One. Which yeah, no, very cute. That was, yeah, a bit wild. But, um, but all them things were... were made available yeah. because I was let off the loose a little bit. Yeah, it was yeah. like, cool, go on, there you go. And no, I've never been able to do that. Yeah, no, um, nice to be share, share that as well. Yeah. Like, it's not all on you. And then it all come crashing down because I probably, it went from, I'm a new dad, I've got a family, I need to support mm. and doing what I'm doing now financially isn't going to last forever. I was earning minimal amounts. Yeah. I, at one point, I was taking like 130 quid a week owning the shop because everything else everything was going else back in. First, yeah, and yeah. I was like, but given my situation before, trust me, that was almost better. And I was like, I need to need to solidify this life. Um, so I got chatting with my business partner. I was like, obviously we had a 50-50 split. And I was like, I, everything you do, I appreciate. And I need, but I need to make a life myself now. And he completely understood it. He had a very, very successful uh, job. 
He, yeah. he had his He wasn't salary. relying on that. That was yeah. a side and hustle. And he knew that was my everything. Mm. And I didn't have a side hustle. I didn't I didn't have that means to be able to go and do yeah. something else. Um, so he was like, cool, tell you what, I'm going to make a deal. You're going to buy me out of the business um, and it will be yours. And I was like, cool. Made a, made a figure. I was paying him weekly. Beautiful. And I was like, sweet, cool. I was like, right, the ball's rolling now. The minute he stepped away... And this flood of paperwork come up on my desk. And I was like, so what's all this about then? Yeah. I was so oblivious to it. Mm. I'd lived before yeah. them since, and this is not really a sob story, but like since the age of like 16, I've looked after myself and n not well. Like I'd, I basically lived on my own from 16, like moved out, didn't have a clue what was going on, got myself in loads of debt and had to try and work life out really quick. And that's when I went to renting rooms. But with all of that, there weren't many bills to look after. There wasn't many things. And the bills I was looking after, I weren't looking after. Yeah, It was getting bad. So when all this, it was like I went into trauma. And no responsibility at that stage. It's like, no, oh, I owe money, I've got Harley. nothing. There's nothing to my it. My Harley yeah. was my responsibility. Yeah. That was like, I had a finance on that mm. and I weren't even paying that. And I was like, I am not doing yeah. well with um, <laughs> And then, so it was like, when I got, Jeez. when I had to take control of everything mm. it was like trauma obviously I, I remember looking at these things going water bill gas bill yeah. electric bill like do, do, how often do I pay these and I was like shit and you know I was like I'm on my own now you know mm. I didn't want to burden that with anyone either and I'd done what every I think nine what every business owner has ever done in a life and I just went like that yeah. hiding and I'm just going to try and deal with this myself. And it put me into a real bad place. Mm. Um, I mean, I think there's so many owners out there that, you know, I do think there's a, there's a stage in my career that, you know, I felt as an owner, there was a, that was my job as an owner. I was meant to know everything, be able to deal with everything and still be fine with it. Yeah. And even today, there's still points where just stuff gets too much for me. And I'm, yeah. I'm definitely got better at going to my, my team and saying, listen, I've got a ton on at the moment. I'm yeah. struggling a little bit. Yeah. Cut me a bit of slack. Absolutely. Um, and I've got a lot of people in the industry that I'll reach out to. Yeah. But, you know, I've been doing it years and years and I'm a proper old dog and even I still get it. You know, to be doing that in the early stages of a career with the early stages of babydom. Yeah. It was, that's tough, man. It's wild, yeah. I mean, it carried, carried a heavy burden as well. Mm. A lot of things come off of it which I weren't happy with and it took a like literally like head against a wall scenario to go right let's get the shit together um, and I think just being honest with yourself mm. like it was I went from trying to do everything and think like telling myself you need to do this to actually going do you know what I'm not the best for this role yeah. delegation who can I get to do this I can't do this who can I get to do it and you sacrifice like money yeah, you know accountants things like this you know I I was like, right, okay, if I can pay a better accountant, what else can he provide for me other than just once a year doing my books? Done my payroll, sorted this out, made mm. sure that I was looked after. Um, I made a manager at a shop. He helped with absolutely everything, yeah. um, which I was super grateful for. And then, and then it realized, I got to another point, it's a couple of years down the line, I thought, do you know what? I need another partner. I need a, So I made a connection and done a deal with someone else to be a silent partner, which financially gave me a lot, a lot of support yeah. to then create something which was inevitably long lasting and going to give me a bit more freedom. Mm. Not something where every week I'm like, I've got to fix that. I've got to change that. Mm. I still get that. <laughs> I think that doesn't that ever changes, but generally speaking, it just gave me a bit of a stable ground and a bit of leeway to actually learn. Yeah. Like, which everyone needs time. Like no, no one, no one can really learn mm. under pressure. Yeah, and I don't think, I mean, it's not, it's not like a, a, a given skill. Do you know what I mean? You do have to learn these things. Yeah. I think being the owner, being the boss, you know, I think a lot of the way we deal with people, you try, you try, and it's an extension of your own personality. Yeah. But running it, business, you know, money management and all that kind of stuff, yeah. take some learning, man. It's not and something it's, you're it's meant to be like. It's not one for all either. Like, I, I've, you know, I've been... Um, Quite fortunate, I, I've been getting a bit of mentoring from uh, Lee Stafford, and Great, he's a business. Mm. You know, it, he's very, very well in tune, and he's worked with a lot of cool people that yeah. you know know their stuff. And 
everything so far, he's basically he's been telling me to read books. <laughs> he's been like talking about something. He goes, do you understand? I'm like, no. He's like, read this book. And I've read more books in the last yeah. kind of year than I think I've ever read in my life. And as good as they are, I've realized this isn't universal. Like a lot, a lot of business seems universal, like your substandards. But there's so many different elements and so many different things. And I do think you do need to do a bit of digging and do a bit of training on yourself to be able to mentally cope with scenarios, which I don't think anyone can teach you that. Only you know whether you can go, yeah, you know, okay, I've got that, I worked yeah. that, or fuck this, I'm out the door. Like, yeah. I can't, I can't deal with this. And especially nowadays, people, I don't, I don't think people are. I don't want to say people aren't as tough anymore because you know that's not right. I, I just think there's a lot of there's a lot of help out there for people mm. because there's a lot of help people think they need it but most of the time they're not willing to take it yeah so I mean I think there's an element of pain you got to go through to kind of to, to grow and to learn yeah I mean I think I mean I'm a big stickler for it but I do think the way our industry was treated through lockdown and COVID was oh, yeah. was harsh and I've got some amazing friends of mine that that I've known for a long, long time, mm. who just got kicked senseless. Yeah. Um, and, you know, their, their emotional and mental health was battered by trying to make it work. You know, their self-employed systems didn't work because there was no, no um, furloughing, there was no money. Yeah, you know, they were getting the odd grant, but that was about it. And then even when they came back, people were working from home. So I think yeah. everyone in the West End and the city were really taking a kick in. I think the... The counter from that has really, really changed our industry mm, because, yeah. like you just said, people, especially barbers, there was a lot of barbers coming into the industry whilst COVID mm. kicked off. With that, there's you know there's a lot of people who've done the very wrong thing of cutting hair from home and stuff, and there's yeah. a lot of people who are trained in who were mm. cutting hair at home and watching videos and things like that. A lot of education, a lot of self, a lot yeah, of free self, education, the self-educated barber, but. There's, you know, like we've said, that we didn't have that. No. We, if we want to learn something, we had to watch someone or make a mistake on a haircut and learn how to do it again next yeah. time. Um, you couldn't quickly go, oh, let's go back five minutes and, and redo yeah, that. that yeah. And depending on your social circles, you didn't really, barbers never really used to chat to each other and learn off each no. other um, when I was growing up. And I'd done um, a stint the other day with, um, done a demo at the London School of Barbering. Um, and there was a nine-week class going on. And I always was a bit like, oh, okay, I don't know what you can do in nine weeks. I was blown away yeah. by these kids. And I was like, holy shit. And I asked a lot of them, I was like, I know you've done this course, but how else have you learned? And then a lot of them had been cutting there for a while mm. and they learned off Instagram and things like this. And there's two things, I think, with that. One, it's great because the information is out there for people to learn. Yeah, People are learning skills that, I might not even be able to pick up because I'm my mental capacity for it isn't quite there. Whereas these kids or younger they, people, yeah. maybe some older people as well, but like, they've grown up with that whole yeah, thought process. It's that they? quick information mm. which we are not designed for. Like mm. our information that we had to learn come with hours of watching yeah, and repetitive practice, practice. Yeah, yeah. information now and learning is mm. quick fire, and yeah. that is how our brains are. I think mm. adjusting. We're we're going right. I can take in thirty seconds of this information. You try and talk to me for an hour. While I'm going to go sleep somewhere. Yeah. And I see it at the barber shows. I see it if we do mm. like a forty five minute demonstration on an hour. You see them get ten minutes in like, yeah, like that. They're yeah. gone. Whereas if I showed them a ten second fade or thirteen second, like a thirty second video mm. of like a couple of clips, how to section, how to do a skin fade, it's in there. Yeah, and. I mean, I think the only issue, with, and I don't disagree, and I mean, like I say, I think you know, with the, 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 the nine, 12 week beginners yeah. to, to, to trained kind of route mm. yeah. gets a lot of debate. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. And I, I, hands up, I've been one of the people going, that's nah, bollocks. Yeah, yeah. And I've had people come to me and go, I've done the course. I'm like, cool, show me what you got. Show the haircut. I'm like, 
yeah, how long will you say your course was? And they were like, oh, no, it's, I'm like, yeah, mate, like, you're nowhere near ready, but we can start again. And that's the bit, and I think that's mm. that start point. You, you know, you can see it, you can do it, but you need to you need to do it on about kind of 40 different types of hair because you yeah. can suddenly see what that on fine hair, Absolutely. that on curly hair, that on thick hair, yeah. that on someone who's going a bit bald, and yeah. you're like, oh, shit, the same haircut can look brilliant yep. and shit. yeah. On different hair types, yeah, and not I think all haircuts that's the, are universal. And that's the bit, and I do think that's that start point yeah, that you then absolutely. that you then grow from. You know, it's like quickly getting your driver's license and then jumping in a Formula One car. Yeah. Like you're gonna yeah. find out the, really quickly, like mm. how hard it can be. But um, I think one of the problems with it is that young people now have. Off of back of COVID, there's a lot of educators online, a lot of people going into their own studios, mm. just doing single one to one clientele. And a lot of these people have done really well. It looks like they've done really yeah. well. They're cutting footballers, haircuts, things like that. So, a lot of these people, especially some of the ones I spoke to the other day, that's what they want to do. They mm. want to they want to cut football players' hair and yeah. they think they're going to earn a couple of grand a week. And it's that. I think they're going to be hit heavy with realisation. Well, I think they're also going to miss out on the fact that the industry is a really rich tapestry. Yeah. And that's the bit, I think. You know, whether you are behind the chair doing four an hour, you know, or or two an hour, or whatever your style of barbershop is, yeah. or whether you're doing show work or pop-up or mm. fashion week, or you've got this huge kind of spectrum to play in. Um, and you need to have you need to have tried as many as you can. Yeah. And I think if you go at it just for one slice, even if you get there, which isn't that likely, but even if you get there, yeah. is it really what you want? Yeah. You know, the amount of yeah. people that get there, you kind of arrive in the cake shop and you go, you know what, I fancy something savoury. Yeah. And I think that's the problem. I think you need to kind of spread across the industry yeah. and try it all. And that I think that takes, uh, a, that is a case of taking a look at yourself as a barber mm. and going, what, why am I in this industry? Mm. Like a lot of people now don't think they're seeing five, ten years time. Yeah. They're working in the moment, yeah. which is cool. You know, like I'm envious of it. Like mm. they're loving it. Like, which is fine. But you know, I when I gave a class the other day, I, I I said, "Who's got a plan?" No one put their hand up. I was like, "What are your plans?" And they were like, "Oh, I was, you know, learn cut hair and like, be qualified." I was like, "What's your plan?" 10, 20 years time. And they're like, oh, I'm not going to think that far. I was like, you got to. Yeah. I was like, you really must. But I was like, because you're not all young. Like, I was like, I I kind of knew roughly where I wanted to be when I was like, I started at 14. When I was about 18, 19, I was like, right, okay, I've got 10 years to get to here. Never yeah. thought it was going to be owning a shop, granted, but I knew how much money I needed to roughly take. Um, and I knew the skill set I needed to be able to last that long. Um, yeah. which I don't think people are talking about, no. thinking about longevity. And, and equally, as you say, though, you've also got, you know, along the way, life is happening. Yeah. That, you know, you're like, oh, no, I can live on 130 quid a week. I'm doing all right. Yeah. It's like, oh, I've got a kid. Yeah. I've got, I've got this that wants feeding. Oh, shit. Yeah. And just life happens. And I think the more yeah. balanced and, and solid you are, mm. um, the better. And I think, like we're saying about kind of ownership, it's that, getting out into the community and asking and talking and sharing. Yeah. It certainly keeps me sane. You know, when I get hit yeah. by a problem, I'm feeling, I feel much better about asking for help now. Yeah. Um, Which isn't an easy thing to do. No, it's you. really not, but it definitely is the shortcut to, to it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, looking after, and I think that's the bit as owners, you have to be nice to yourself sometimes. You've yeah. got you to give yourself a little bit of love to kind of go, it's all right, actually, yeah. I'm doing a good job. Absolutely. In very adverse Times. I think it's, um, again, just taking a look at the position you are in as an owner as well and going, mm. right, do I work, want to work on this business or do I want to work in it? Mm. Because that's that's a massive divide. Yeah. Right? And that's something I personally have like gone, right, so far I'm working on a business and I'm working in a business as a technician. Yeah. I can't be a technician and an accountant and this and that. Mm. So I have to allow myself the time to be these things and then work out a plan in the future do I want to be cutting there forever? Yeah. What's an exit strategy? How do you get yeah, out? Yeah, it's all you know, it's the questions you have mm. to ask yourself. And I don't think some well, people you go, don't mate, ask you've questions. asked yourself the next question. So you've got the heartbreak yeah. club. You're being you're definitely kind of pursuing and pushing kind of creativity in the industry. Yeah. You're getting a good reputation media wise. You've become a bit of a bit of a media darling. <laughs> media darling. <laughs> um, but yeah. what's next? Is a heartbreak club have a heartbreak two? Does there seem do you do you see 
Do you have a bit of a plan going ahead? Kind of, yeah. Um, you so, don't have to share it, but it might better viewing. Yeah, you just have to guess. No, um, <laughs> no, I think so. Again, taking a massive reset and looking at where we was mm. as a position for a, a good, I'd say probably the last three years, especially with the, how the way the world's been. I've just yeah. been like, right, I know where I want to be, but let's just see what happens, like to a degree, but have mm. like a well educated guess at where we're going. You know, trying to get all of the bricks and mortar sorted so we have a strong stability. Um, and from then, again, some of the stuff Lee's helped me with, like, just, uh, I've read this book, can't remember the life of me, what it's called, but I'll try and find if out. If it comes to your people. email, we'll stick it on your, yeah. uh, when it goes yeah, out. it was a game changer. I think the guy, a guy called Michael Gabler or something. Um, and it, again, it just breaks down small, small local businesses. And one of the best things it gave for me, it was like, really again coming back to being a technician it made me look at going right i'm a, I'm a technician in a barbershop what life li what lifetime does that have for me mm. in this industry and then it starts looking at business and going right what is the heartbreak club like what is heartbreak club to me and for a long time it was just a place to facilitate what i done um now it, i've done a u-turn on that and i'm looking at it as prototype one oh, okay. it's I mean, it's been nine years, so obviously a lot's happened in nine years, but now it's prototype. Like, the last couple of months, I'm like, right, okay, prototype one, let's get Heartbreak Club, everything on paper. Every system, mm. every activation in the shop, every, every element of that shop, as big or small as it may be, let's get that bit sorted and the best of that. So it might be doing the towers. How can we work at doing the towers better financially? How can we save money? Time-wise, yeah. how can we save time as a staff? Um, what is the most ideal time to open? What time should we be closing so we clean the shop? Right? And there's all these little things yeah. which are minimal and seem rather like... But and a lot kind of happens autopilot, doesn't it? I mean, yeah, you, know, you kind you of go, on, where it. are these systems coming from? And actually they yeah. work, so let's make sure the, we can The systems can are so them. important. Right? And yeah. when you look at them, it could be something as silly as like, saving 10 minutes uh, washing up. Yeah. Like, at you know, the minute we don't have an apprentice. So it's like, right, how are we going to save that time in the day rather than nicking it later on or finding using that time? Because all these 10 minutes, all these 15 yeah, minutes yeah. add They're up to being an hour at the end of the mm. day where you could have another client and offer me personally, I could have an hour to work on the books yeah. or an hour to look at my advertisement. And, um, you know, something I, I've took as a role for myself is, getting the shop out there visually, like our marketing, how mm. we are aesthetic. Like we've done a rebrand recently, so we've done a different design logos and stuff and how we are portrayed, the language of our of our haircuts, the language we use when we're describing what we do. You know, all these things come into place and it's, you essentially just have to prototype yourself and make a massive A4 folder and divide everything into it and they all come into a sandwich. So if you was like, I find it's a bit of our break club, I'd be like, Cool. Here you go. This, is, yeah, this yeah. is Heartbreak Club. So, how would the young? Just to kind of wrap it up, how did? How do you feel the young Wes would be looking at you now, putting your folder oh, together? He'd think I'm a proper. <laughs> he'd think I'm a proper wanker. Um, <laughs> I still think that, but no. Um, but uh, it's, 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 a, it's an absolute genius thought process. It's just getting all that simple. life. It's getting all your life, all your skills, all your practices, yep. all your beliefs, all your standards. Yeah. All your kind of passions, and actually make it into a into a into a, I, a book. I think one of the things for me, going back on like you know the stuff I have been doing as a side as a side of the shop, is f most of my life, like most barbers, most people in the creative world, not been looking for accreditation, but I've been, I suppose acceptance isn't the right word as well, but I've been trying to do things to be proud of myself, mm. which. I think kind of goes without saying what a lot of people do. They want people to be proud of them. Yeah, they want, you want to be happy with what you do. Now, I come from a creative background. I come from music background. I was in music for years. And that's the same thing. I stood up on stage because I want people to like me. Mm. Like, you know, I could dive well deeper into that with a psychologist. But like, the, it all comes back to doing something and being aware that you've done something good. Yeah. And I'd done that for a long time with no end product. And now it's going right. I need to do this, that, and whatever to not only make myself proud, but to make my family secure, mm. to make this industry secure. And that goes across the board. That's yeah. not just shop, that's doing all my media work. And I'm like, if it doesn't have either a financial, a light, like 
So something I've worked out recently is the return on what I do. I don't work for financial gain. And that sounds really, mm-hmm. really no, no, stupid. I think a lot of people do. Yeah, yeah. I've replaced the word and the idea of money in my head. I work on a life return. So if I go and do a hair show and they pay me a day rate, how much life is that going to give me? Mm-hmm. Is that going to give me one day out of the shop yeah. uh, and that's it? Or is that going to pay for me to have a week with my family? Mm. That's, the, that's the return on life that I yeah. want, not the, re- not the financial return. And I, now that, that dictates what I do. If, yeah. if I, we can get another member of staff, how much life is that going to take away from me trying to work things I out? Think that's How much that, life yeah, is no, going to return? I think that's the, that's the big E. I think it's that point that you a lot of us accidentally become business owners mm. and then forget that we own the businesses, not the businesses own us. Yeah. And I think it's nice to hear that you've got to that point where you're owning the business because it's like most of us, I've definitely been owned by the business for a long time. Yeah. So no, mate. Pleasure. Gorgeous, mate. <laughs> I feel there's another one in there, but I think we've run on. Yeah. Um, really appreciate your time, Wes. Great no stuff problem. and hugely good luck, man. I'm loving it. I appreciate Thank it. you very much. Welcome to the Noble Barber Podcast. We're always looking for interesting people and interesting stories. If you know someone or you are someone with a great story that you want to share, get in touch and come join me on the sofa. Thanks very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed the episode and we'll see you next time.